Hello and welcome to Trinity Fit Over 40 podcast with me, Rob Burkhead. And me, Ben Hughes. We are the co-founders of Trinity Transformation and creators of the Fit Over 40 method. And together with our world-class coaching team, we have helped more than 6,000 women over 40 to fit back into their favorite clothes over the past decade. For more information about what we do, go to www.fit40info.com. So in today's episode, we're going to reveal the best diet during menopause and perimenopause. So sit back and relax and welcome to today's podcast. So one of the most common questions we get asked about how to lose weight over 40 is what is the best diet to drop a dress size during menopause and perimenopause? We've worked with so many women in their 40s and 50s who felt stuck because they didn't know what they should be eating to get the scales moving or how best to manage their nutrition during the menopause and perimenopause. So they, instead, they were trying all the things which have worked in their 20s and 30s, trying things like keto, low carb, shake diets, clean eating, meal plans, slimming groups, online programs, plant based eating or vegan. But nothing was really working, not only for their weight loss, for example, you know, they'd step on the scales after a week of dieting, they'd see zero movement or be maybe even heavier than before. But also in terms of their menopause symptoms, they were finding that what they were eating and the diet they were following was possibly making those symptoms even worse. And when you're feeling really bad and you're not seeing results, it's very, very hard to stay motivated. And that's why a lot of women end up giving up on the nutrition entirely, leaving them stuck and unable to get their weight under control, choosing clothes to cover up problem areas rather than wearing the things they like, hating shopping for clothes because nothing fits quite right, especially in the more trendy shops, staring at a wardrobe full of amazing clothes they can no longer fit into, and worrying that this is just a part of the aging process that they'll have to accept. And the reason this happens is really simple. So women's bodies and hormones start to change as they approach the menopause, which can make it easier to gain weight, especially around the middle, and it can make it more difficult to lose it again with the normal methods of dieting. But if you have the right nutrition approach, one which is designed to work for women who are heading towards the menopause, you can quickly and easily get the scales moving, drop a couple of dress sizes and feel incredible wearing anything you like in as little as 12 weeks. So in today's podcast, we're going to reveal the best nutrition approach for women during the menopause so you can do exactly that. Awesome. So let's get straight into it. There's a few kind of nutritional fundamentals that you need to get right. And then we're also going to go into some vitamins and minerals and other kind of little tweaks you can do to really optimize everything to get the best results physically and also to feel the best. So the first thing you need to do is make sure you're making the right food choices because certain food choices are actually known to make the menopause symptoms worse. So if you are approaching the menopause, if you're in that perimenopause period, or you're going through the menopause and you're having really, really significant symptoms, this is going to be really important for you. If you're also noticing things like weight gain, which is often quoted as a symptom of the menopause, um, then this also will really, really help. So the foods that you need to be careful of are what we call the WADS foods. So this stands for it's W-A-D-S, WADS, wheat, alcohol, dairy, and sugar. And we can kind of lump these into two different groups. So we can look at sugar and alcohol as one group, and then wheat and dairy as another group. Because there's two different kind of reasons why we want to avoid these. So if we look at sugar and alcohol first, there's a few reasons why these cause a lot of problems, especially for women in their 40s and 50s around menopause. So first of all, with sugar and alcohol, in fact, with all of the WADS foods, but especially sugar and alcohol, they're very, very Moorish. The more you have, the more you want. And they can actually be quite addictive for some people. So you may have felt that uncontrollable urge to have something sugary in the evening or when you're stressed. You may have had that urge to pour a glass of wine after a really stressful day at work. And before you know it, the whole bottle's gone. And the issue is both of these foods are very high in calories, especially when you combine them with what you have around them. So usually a sugary food, something high in refined sugar, like a biscuit, a cake, um, chocolate, they usually combine with a lot of fat as well, which is very calorie dense. Fat is essentially oil. Oil is like you run your car on petrol. If you have a petrol car or a diesel car, it's, on, it's run on oil because it's so high in energy, it can even power a car. So sugars generally combine with that, which makes it very, very high in calories. And alcohol generally, egg, first of all, alcohol is just inherently high in calories. There's seven calories per gram of alcohol, which is almost as high as fat and a lot higher than carbs which is uh, something people think is you know, something to avoid carbs, but alcohol has even more calories. Um, so it's very, very easy to overconsume it. But also when I speak to a lot of clients, they say if they do end up having you know, a couple of glasses of wine, 
they then have you know the nuts come out or the crisps come out and before they know it they've eaten their way through like half a sharing bag of crisps or more or you know half a pack of nuts which is really calorie dense again so it's not just the food it's what they come packaged with so sugar and alcohol are both very high in calories are both very moorish but what's even more important if you are kind of experiencing these menopause symptoms is they will make them worse they will disrupt your hormones and make these things more unpleasant than they already are so they're like pouring petrol on a fire you've already got the fire which might be your hot flushes it might be joint aches and pains it might be affecting your sleep it might be making you feel uncomfortable you might have brain fog you might have migraines if you then pour sugar and alcohol on that fire you're going to make all of those things worse you're going to be more likely to have them and they're going to be worse they're going to last for longer and feel even worse and for a lot of people this is then becomes this like vicious cycle that will disrupt your sleep and if you have disrupted sleep, we've talked about in another podcast, you get disrupted hunger um, in, and um, satiety signals. So leptin and ghrelin are hunger hormones. They control when we feel full and when we feel hungry. And when you don't get good sleep, these get out of whack and they increase cravings and you're more likely to overeat and snack too much. And there's a really interesting study that's covered in Matthew Walker's book, Why We Sleep, where people were given a buffet and people sleeping five hours a night versus people sleeping eight hours a night, ate 300 calories more in that buffet when they were told to just eat until they felt full. And that's enough to then go from losing weight to actually gaining weight for a lot of the clients we work with, just that difference in, in 300 calories per meal. And it can become a real vicious cycle if you're getting less sleep, you then have more cravings because your hunger hormones are disrupted, which then means you eat more sugar and then you're struggling to sleep. So you might then end up drinking to try and get off to sleep better, even though it actually disrupts your sleep once you're asleep. And then you get worse hot flushes, you get broken sleep, you're woken up in the middle of the night, and then because you've had less sleep, you then have more cravings and you eat more sugar, then you drink more and it becomes this vicious cycle. And even if it's only one of those elements of just sugar or just alcohol, it will make that cycle worse and worse and worse and worse until you're ending up gaining loads of weight because you're over consuming sugar and alcohol and you're feeling awful because all of those menopause symptoms are worse. So we recommend that you avoid these eight at the time. When our clients join our program, our Fit Over 40 program, they actually cut it out entirely for two weeks, do WODS foods entirely. Now, the other part of the WODS foods is wheat and dairy. So the W and D part of the WODS foods. And just like sugar and alcohol, these foods are also really calorie dense. So wheat is ground down from flour, uh, from flour into flour to form this very, very fine powder. So fl uh, flour, which is what generally is what's used in, you know, in foods that we eat, we don't eat wheat like it's just come off um, out of the field. It's really, really dense. So it's like pure calories. It's, it's ground down and ground down into this really, really fine powder that means it's really packed in in terms of the calories. And that's great if you're preparing for a marathon. You know, that, that classic meal, Lucy's running a half marathon on Sunday, um, the fleet half. We're going to go out and probably eat a load of pasta the night before because she needs to have the, the, that, you know, that food in to run for two, two and a bit hours. But if you're sat at your desk all day, you don't need all of that really calorie dense food. And that's what most people are doing. They, you know, we speak to, they're eating bread or they're eating pasta um, all the time. And it's they're, they're not actually doing the activity to burn it off, especially as you get older and things change, which Ben's going to touch on in a minute. And then when it comes to dairy, dairy is great for turning a baby cow into a fully grown cow. Like we often don't spend the time to think, where's this come from? Dairy is usually cow's milk. And it's usually produced by the cow to grow a calf into a cow. And a cow's pretty big. It's not great if you're a human who actually wants to get smaller, not bigger, because it tends to be pretty calorie dense again. There are good things about it, but it tends to be pretty calorie dense. And it doesn't always work so well for women around the menopause. And one of the reasons for this is intolerances. So it's very, very common to have like a mild intolerance to either wheat or dairy. We see it all the time in our clients. And if you do have an intolerance, what will happen is it will, if you eat that food, if it's wheat or if it's dairy, it will actually cause issues inside your body. It will, it will trigger the stress hormone cortisol. And that can lead to the weight gain triangle, which is a number of additional hormonal side effects. So affects leptin, which we talked about already, which will give you worse cravings. Um, it affects insulin, which is a fat storage hormone, meaning you're more likely to store fat around the middle. And it affects your thyroid, which controls your metabolism and it will slow your metabolism down. So it's not ideal if you want to lose weight, if you're eating these foods that are triggering that weight gain triangle, increasing your cravings, causing more fat storage around the middle and slowing your metabolism down. So what we find is if we cut out these WADS foods, so wheat, alcohol, dairy, and sugar, we do it entirely for two weeks with our clients um, just once. And then um, we just recommend they avoid it 80% of the time. So they're not a staple. They see amazing results. Their energy goes up. 
their lethargy is gone. They have better hair, skin and nails. Their joints feel better. They lose weight as well often. And I have a couple of examples here because like, I can say all this stuff, but it's not really, it doesn't hit home quite like hearing it from a, you know, a, a woman who is um, experiencing these things and, and has then made this change to cut out the wads food. So the first one's from Sa um, Sandra. So she said, this is, these are posted in our, um, one of our WhatsApp groups for our clients. She said, hi all, I don't normally post things into this um so this is my first post I start on the 11th of april so i'm on week four so this was obviously last year um, i've got two wins to share i've been to see the practice nurse today for blood pressure check and get weighed my blood pressure is now normal and i can stay off the blood pressure meds so that was a big reason why she signed up is she was going to have to go on these blood pressure meds and then she said win number two i've lost five kilos just thought i'd share so that's within four weeks she's lost five kilos so nearly a stone um, all just by making these changes I've just talked about. And then the second one is from Jenny. So she said, I'm just entering week four. So only three weeks in, um, don't have a huge amount to lose. Just trying to focus on losing fat and gaining muscle. Just weighed after a weekend away where I definitely ate more, had a few drinks and I lost more this week than the previous two. Now that's just natural fluctuations, but she's lost five and a half pounds. She said, I lost five and a half pounds in three weeks, mostly body fat. And what is this witchery? The best part about all this is my clothes are almost fitting again. I'm feeling so much stronger physically and mentally. So those are just the example of what changes can be achieved if you eliminate these WODS foods and then just eat them 80% of the time uh, on top of making the changes Ben is going to talk about next. So the next thing we recommend is to optimize for what we call the key three. So there are three kind of key nutrients you need to focus on, which are calories, protein, and fiber. So I'll dive, in, dive into each one in a bit more detail. So the first one is calories. So as people get older, their metabolism tends to slow down. So you'll see around about a 10% decrease in your metabolism per decade over the age of 20. So your metabolism is basically what regulates kind of the amount of calories or the amount of energy that your body burns on a day-to-day -day basis. So if we assume that in your 20s, you could maintain your weight on 2000 calories per day, then if we were to look at a 10% decrease every decade, in your 30s, that's going to reduce to 1,800. In your 40s, that's going to reduce to 1,620. And then your 50s, that's going to reduce to 1,460. So between your 20s and your 50s, it's almost a, it's just over a 500 calorie difference in the amount that you need to eat per day in order to maintain your weight, which is quite a significant amount. And I think a lot of people find that Although their body is changing, their habits with their food don't necessarily change to take that into account. So a lot of people find that, you know, they're, they're doing what they did in their 20s, eating the same amount that they used to do in their 20s or 30s. But now in their 40s or 50s, they're finding that by doing the same, they're seeing their weight go up or not seeing their weight come down. And this can be compounded by other factors, for example, lack of sleep. So if, if one of the symptoms of your menopause, one of the effects of that is that you're not getting the best quality sleep or not getting as much sleep as you used to, that can then increase your hunger hormone so that you feel more cravings for unhealthy foods and then are more likely to overeat as a result. It can also be compounded by reduced activity level with a desk-based job. So typically as people get older, their activity level also does tend to reduce. So the amount of steps you're doing per day, how much you're moving per day. And also if you're getting more responsibility in your role as you move up through the career ladder, that also adds additional stress which can then um, again lead to increased cravings um, and lead to that weight gain triangle that you mentioned previously Rob so this is why you need to be really careful with the nutrition as you get older so there, there's the thing you need to focus on in terms of calories is focusing on nutrient dense foods so foods such as meat such as fish such as vegetables those are kind of the the key things those foods are going to contain um most of the things that you need in order to function, in order to see really good progress in terms of results. I'm going to talk about protein in a second, but essentially meat and fish are very, very dense in protein. The vegetables are going to be very, very dense in vitamins and minerals. We're going to talk about vitamins and minerals in a second as well. So those are the things to focus on, meat, fish, vegetables. The things to avoid are too many processed foods. So the processed foods you want to avoid are those that are containing those WADS foods that Rob was talking about previously or anything with a really, really long ingredient list. So the longer the ingredient list on a food, the more it tends to be kind of processed. So things like biscuits, cake, chocolate, bread, crisps, et cetera. These highly processed foods, they don't keep you feeling full because 
because they're in process, your body can digest them really quickly. So you'll get a really quick burst of energy from these foods. Like if you were to pour petrol on a pot on a fire, you get a big flash of energy and then it dies away very, very quickly. So you get that big energy boost if you eat, you know, that's, that's why we, there is such thing as a sugar rush. If you have three biscuits, you might get a bit of an energy boost for a very short period of time. And then that energy is going to die down. And actually you'll, you'll slump to having less energy than you did before. And it's the same with hunger. You eat those biscuits, you feel full for a very short period of time. And then that hunger comes back. So you can also uh, combat that slow metabolism as well, not only by avoiding those foods, which aren't going to keep you full. And I'll go through what will keep you full in a second, but you can also combat that slow metabolism by building muscle through strength training. So this is, what, this is one thing that we have all of our clients do. And the more muscle mass you have, the faster your metabolism. So as people get older, their muscle mass tends to decrease as well as their bone density. But if you, if you do strength training, you can kind of combat this and you know having more muscle mass is pretty much always a good thing it's not going to make you feel bulky it's not going to make you feel you know be really kind of uh, just like hefty and bulky it's going to make you strong it's going to make you toned it's going to add curves and shape to your body in the right places so don't be afraid of gaining muscle and also it's going to help build your metabolism and another benefit of that is the type of training that you would do for it so list training is what we typically recommend or low impact strength training We've done previous podcasts on the best, you know, workouts to do for women over 40, if you're interested in that. But if you do this training typically three times a week, like our clients do, um, the recovery from this training, the period of recovery takes about two to three days, meaning that if you're in a good routine with it, you're always in this period where you're recovering from a workout. And specifically with straight strength training, when you're recovering from it, it actually elevates your metabolism. So your body needs additional calories coming in. You can cope with additional food coming in and it will use those additional calories for growth and for repair and to help you recover from those workouts. So if you're doing strength training three times a week, you basically always got an elevated metabolism as a, as a result of recovering from that training. The next thing to focus on then, the next element of the key three. So calories is number one. Second thing is protein. Yeah, so we give all of our clients a protein target and tell them this is about the amount of protein you need to eat every day. Typically, this tends to be about twice the recommended daily allowance. So the recommended daily allowance is it's ideal for someone who kind of just wants to just sort of exist and just kind of continue to survive. But if you want to thrive, if you want to do strength training, you want to recover from training, you want to have you know a, a really good physique, you want to lose body weight, you want to feel fit and feel toned. You need to have more than that amount. So the way to do this is essentially to eat protein with every meal. So if you hit protein for every single meal, um, you'll hit your overall protein target for the day. And the benefits of protein, the, one of the main ones is that it's very, very filling. So it signals to your brain that you are full and that you are satisfied and it stops craving. So it does this in two ways by a lowering the hunger hormone ghrelin. So we have this, this hormone called ghrelin. And if you have high levels of ghrelin in your system, which can be made worse again from things like not getting enough sleep. So if your hormone, your ghrelin level is very, very high, you'll constantly feel hungry. And you'll constantly crave unhealthy foods. Unfortunately, it's not really, we don't tend to crave healthy foods. We don't tend to think, God, I really, really want to have a, you know, some salad leaves or broccoli or whatever. It tends to be unhealthy things that your body decides to crave. So Eating enough protein will help lower that hunger ho hormone. So if you struggle from cravings, it's going to make a massive, massive difference. And it also boosts a hormone called peptide YY, which is another appetite, appetite regulating hormone. But I mean, the overall thing you need to know is if you get enough protein, you'll feel full and satisfied. You won't crave unhealthy foods. The other benefit of protein as well is that it has it gives you lower net calories than carbs and fat. So what I mean by that is every food that you take in your body requires a certain amount of energy to digest that food. So carbs and fats, they come into your body. They're very, very easy di easily digested. They're very, very easily broken down. So if you imagine, uh, you know, let's imagine that the way your digestion works, you've got little workmen in there who break all of the food down that you, that you put in with hammers. You put in carbs and fats. It's like putting in very, very easy to break down things, things that are not very robust, not very strong, it could be, uh, you know, 
glass bottles. It could be things like bits of polystyrene, plastic. It's very, very easy. You do one hit with a hammer, smashes into a million pieces. It digests very, very quickly and very, very easily. Protein, though, is more difficult for your body to break down. It's more challenging for it to digest. So it's like you're putting in, it's like a, it's like a rock or a brick or something very, very strong where you're, you know, you're having to hit it multiple, multiple times with a hammer in order to break it down into small pieces in order to digest it. So ultimately, if you take in protein, about 30% of the calories that you eat from the protein are required to digest the protein. So if you take in hundred calories of protein, actually only about 70 calories end up getting absorbed into your body and absorbed into your system. So if you hit your protein amount, not only will you feel full, but also you'll take in less calories overall, meaning that you'll see better results in terms of your fitness. And the final benefit of protein is it really helps with growth and repair and recovery from workouts. So um, it's going to help you perform well. It's going to help you. You'll, you do a workout on one day. If you get enough protein the next couple of days, you'll recover more quickly and you'll feel able to train and able to continue with your workouts sooner than if you didn't get enough protein. So that's calories, number one, protein. And the third element of the key three is fiber. So fiber comes in many different forms. Um, I mean, the easiest, I mean, the, the one I'd recommend you try and aim for is just getting plenty of whole, like sort of whole fruits and vegetables. So fruits and vegetables, um, things like oats as well, um, nuts, seeds, etc., all contain a good amount of fiber. If you get enough fiber, it basically slows down your digestion. So if you drink apple juice, for example, which is like, it's the, it's part of an apple, but it's without any of the fiber. That's, that's what an apple is. If you remove any of the fiber, which is kind of a, the substance to it, you drink apple juice, it digests into your body very, very quickly, very, very easily absorbed. There's nothing to break down. Whereas if you eat an apple, um, your body not only gets all of the, everything that was in the apple juice, it's also got the fiber to break down. It's got kind of the, the basis of the apple. So it slows down the digestion. And those foods digest completely differently, even though they're made from the same thing. So if your food is digesting more slowly, that keeps you feeling fuller for a longer period of time. And also, if you get enough fiber, it also protects against many diseases such as diabetes, heart disease, some types of cancer as well. So optimize your diet for the key three. The first thing you need to know is as you get older, your body needs less calories. So you need to get the right amount of calories per day, which will be slightly less than your 20s and 30s. You need to make sure you're doing that with the right foods, including plenty of protein to keep you feeling full and plenty of fiber to also keep you feeling full. And if you do that, even if you're eating less calories than you were previously, you don't, you won't feel starving hungry all the time if you're making the right choices with your nutrition. So the next thing we're going to talk about quickly is phytoestrogen so there's a lot of talk online about phytoestrogens and how they can be used to combat menopause symptoms and avoid the use of hrt but is this really true do they actually work so phytoestrogens are essentially plant-derived compounds that have a similar structure to human estrogen so that's why they're called a phytoestrogen and the theory is you can use this in place of hrt or it will help to alleviate menopause symptoms because it's this kind of like estrogen you're bringing back in to replace what essentially happens during menopause which is where your estrogen levels go from being relatively high they fluctuate through perimenopause and then they end up pretty low and that can cause a lot of the side effects we've talked about today so phytoestrogens estrogens naturally occur in certain foods so specific foods would be things like soybeans soy-based products like tofu um soy milk peanut sesame seeds flax seeds chickpeas berries barley like there's lots of different foods that contain phytoestrogens. And some of the articles out there, again, that are online, they're generally out there to try and get views. They're not necessarily trying to help. And they can only tell a, one piece of the kind of puzzle. They only give you one piece of the puzzle. And the same with a lot of like social media influencers. A lot of them are claiming they can be used instead of HRT. And unfortunately, according to menopause expert, Dr. Louise Newson, you may have heard her. She, you know, she's been in a lot of... Um, different content with Davina McCall recently. She's just released a, a fantastic new book on my shelf up there. Um, in that book, she says, basically the evidence now shows that phytoestrogens do not have the same effect as estrogen produced by the body. So there's no real evidence that they have a beneficial effect on menopause symptoms or health 
compared to um that they have basically no no benefit and if you compare it to estrogen and hrt it's just not even in the same ballpark so they're basically not worth worrying about it can be one of these things like a lot of things nutritionists i've seen talk about that sound very complicated you have to try and get all these individuals you've got to go eat that food and that food and that food and that food and follow this and and it's too complicated especially for like the type of women we work with who are really busy they've got busy stressful jobs they've got families to worry about maybe aging parents and children they're already spinning 15 plates they don't need another 15 things to worry about with their nutrition so really if you have significant menopause symptoms you want to alleviate you can't just do it by eating these specific foods and what you will need to do is either it basically depends on your kind of severity of your menopause symptoms so there's kind of three groups in terms of menopause symptoms. 25% of people will have little to no symptoms. They're the lucky ones who don't really even notice um, or they notice a few changes, but it's not really changing their life much. Then there's 50% of people, so half of people who have fairly noticeable symptoms. So they will have the flushes. They might have some joint aches and pains. They might have some brain fog. Yeah, there's, there's 50 symptoms. I won't go through them all, but they, it doesn't stop them doing normal day to day life. It might make it a bit harder. It might mean they find it a little bit harder to lose weight, but it, it isn't catastrophic. And then there's 25 percent of people who will have what's called severe symptoms that basically makes it almost impossible to do normal day to day life. It's the type of people who have to quit their job and their career. It is a really, really horrible thing for them. And the two things you can do to kind of if, if you're in either the middle 50 percent or the um, the, the 25% when it's really severe is, first of all, do consider HRT. Um, I'll tell you where you can look for more information on that in a minute. Um, the only real way to replace that kind of hormone deficiency if it's really bad is, is by taking a, um, a form of hormone replacement therapy, which replaces that estrogen. Um, but the other thing that has the biggest impact is basically nutrition and lifestyle choices, the stuff we talked about today. So what you're, funny enough, the other stuff you're putting into your body, not the phytoestrogens, which don't really do much, but just the quality of the other stuff. So not too much sugar, not too much alcohol, not too many of those wads foods we talked about, the right amount of calories, protein and fiber, that stuff has a huge impact and having good lifestyle choices. So sleeping well, managing stress, those are the other things that have the biggest impact. And if you want more info on this, check out either Balanced Menopause app or Balanced Menopause website. That is um, a really, really good resource for more info on this and also on HRT. So finding out whether it could be suitable for you because um, all the evidence now points to basically it being healthier than not taking it for most women. Things like heart disease risk um, and a lot of other issues are so much more severe that the, even the very small breast cancer risk, which has now been proven to be very, very, very small, much lower than the risk of... Um, obesity uh, than causing breast cancer or poor nutrition or poor sleep um but that website has all the info on this so that covers kind of the fundamentals we've talked about the kind of the fundamentals of nutrition so we talked about avoiding the words foods we talked about um the key three and we've talked about phytoestrogens but there's a few additional considerations again why don't you kick off with what other things we should be looking for women should be looking for i should say not me and you um around the menopause and perimenopause so there are a few key kind of vitamins and minerals that you need to also take into consideration um, around the menopause, which which you can be deficient in these things basically due to a reduction in estrogen. So the first thing to look at is calcium, which can impact on bone density. So if you don't get enough calcium, in, if your calcium levels are low, you'll have a, you'll be at increased risk of osteoporosis, which is essentially porous bones around the menopause. So calcium is one of the key things for bone density. And we know that this is true for developing children. So, you know, when you're younger, you're always told, you know, you've got to drink milk, et cetera, keep your calcium levels nice and high. But it's also just as important as you age. So calcium is not just found in cow's milk and in dairy. Like, for example, vitamin C is, is not just found in orange juice, although that's kind of the, you know, that's what people think of when they think of vitamin C. So in order to keep your calcium up, one of the key things to do is to have green leafy vegetables with every meal and um, you want to make sure you're taking in some amount of nuts and seeds making sure that you're having soft fish bones and sardines so i i personally i really enjoy those you know when you have the the tins of fish and you have the little bones in the inside the tin that sort of crunch down some people probably hate those but i'm a big fan so soft fish bones and sardines white bait um anchovies things like that as well pulses as well can contain calcium so when we say pulses we mean things like lentils chickpeas etc those kind of things um tofu 
and then also calcium fortified plant-based milks so for example almond milk is usually fortified to be the equivalent of dairy-based milk and it's also around three times less calories for unsweetened almond milk plus for people who for example don't necessarily tolerate dairy well those almond milk sub substitutes and other milk substitutes are a really really good option and as i said will help you boost your calcium levels um the other thing you could do as well is if if you were to take kind of a general multivitamin as well that will also just just top up those levels as well so we usually recommend our clients do what's called the diet makeover so cutting out those wads foods for one to two weeks then introduce wheat and dairy one at a time to see if there's any notable noticeable issues so if there are no issues with dairy people can then reintroduce that dairy for calcium so there are good dairy options you can go for so especially higher protein variants for example reduced fat cheeses um, whey protein cottage cheese high protein yogurts like zero percent fat greek yogurt or the skier yogurts or protein desserts so all of those things you know, they they can do to kind of kill two birds in one stone so you can help boost your protein levels and at the same time boost your calcium levels as long as you can tolerate that dairy and then if you find however that that you have issues with dairy then you can get your calcium from fortified milks so and from a wide variety of plant seeds and nuts in the diet as well so the next vitamin we're going to look at is um well calcium sort of more a mineral but a vitamin that's also really important um, around menopause and perimenopause is vitamin d you've probably heard us talk about before but it's a really really important one it's essential for bone density again so avoiding the osteoporosis which can happen especially for women um, as estrogen levels reduce and that can lead to porous bones it can lead to lower health problems it can lead to breaking bones as you get older but it's also important for energy levels and low energy is one of the things a lot of people mention to us before they sign up with us also helps with regulating mood so avoiding anxiety and depression a lot of that those, those, those kind of symptoms can actually be tracked back to um, people's diet and it also helps with regulating insulin levels so insulin is um, a hormone used to basically it's a storage hormone but it it's one that's used to kind of help us to deal with carbohydrates better. So if you want to be able to eat a few more carbohydrates and, and not gain fat, then this is also important. So vitamin D is an interesting um, vitamin because it actually works more like a hormone than a vitamin. It's produced naturally in the body when your skin is opposed to, so, I suppose, exposed to sunlight. And you actually need quite a lot of sunlight to get enough and we'll come back onto this, but most people are not getting enough sunlight. So if you don't get enough vitamin D or you don't have, your body isn't producing enough, you basically get a load of really, really negative side effects. You get tiredness, you get weakness, you get muscle pain, bone pain, back pain, poor immunity, which is obviously not ideal with COVID still going around. You'll be more susceptible to depression and other kind of mood related disorders. And you'll have a higher risk of type two diabetes, heart disease, weight gain, and cancer. So it's pretty important to have enough vitamin D to keep you healthy and to keep you feeling good. And if you feel good, you're gonna be more likely to make other good choices as well. So how do you get vitamin D? Well, there are a few nutritional sources, things like oily fish, so salmon, sardines, mackerel, red meat, liver, whole eggs, expanding the yolk, fortified foods, but dietary sources actually don't really provide enough. And it's thought that at least a quarter of UK adults are not thought to get enough vitamin D, although I think this is skewed to actually older, people who are working will will get a lot less whereas younger adults might get more and the reason for this is to get enough from the sun you actually need to spend about an hour a day in the sun when the sun is high in the sky so basically when your shadow is shorter than your height so uh, this is going to be around about midday and I don't know about you but even though we run a fitness related business we spend most of the time working on the computer and we're not out in the sun in the middle of the day for an hour or two. And most of the, you know, our clients don't have that luxury either. And you also have to have quite a lot of skin exposed, not just your face to actually absorb that vitamin D because it's, it's produced by sun on your skin. So you have to probably have your arms out, at least if not your legs out as well. So most people we work with are not getting enough. And as you get older, your skin produces less vitamin D as well um, for the same amount of sunlight. So again, typical things get a little bit harder as you get older. And if you have darker skin as well, so if you have darker skin, you're going to actually need longer in the sun to produce the same amount of vitamin D. So 
basically the only way to get enough is to supplement vitamin d it's like it's an essential supplement it's one i take year round uh it's also one i recommend our clients take year round and the uk government recommends everyone takes it year round as well so they recommend people take 10 micrograms of vitamin d a day um but especially in autumn and winter so if you are going to take it only some of the time especially from sort of like september october when the clocks change all the way through until the clocks change back and if you're sat at a desk most of the day i'd probably take it all year round it doesn't have to be anything special you can get it from all these different sites amazon uh vitamin shops parliament and barrett things like that i just try and get a vitamin d3 and make sure there's enough in it uh, it's not expensive and it will give you better energy levels it will help reduce menopause symptoms and side effects uh, and make you as healthy and fit as possible and then the third one to focus on is magnesium. So magnesium is a very important mineral. It's found in all of your tissues, but especially your bones, muscles, and brain. It's really important for mood, for energy levels, for bone density, uh, for sleep as it regulates, regulates melatonin um, and guides your kind of sleep-wake cycles. And as we know, poor sleep, low energy levels, low mood can lead to eating too much. So if you can take care of those things, you're going to see better results in terms of your nutrition, better results in terms of your results. So magnesium gets depleted by two things. First of all, stress, and second of all, changing hormones. So for many of the clients that we work with, their jobs are really high-paced and really stressful. So that's depleting their magnesium. And if they're also menopausal, this usually leads to lower magnesium levels as well. So you can get magnesium for food, um, but it's hard to get enough especially when life is stressful. Because if you can imagine um, your, your levels are continually depleting, it's like if you're running a bath, you've got the plug out um, and you, you know the, the, um, the magnesium level is just draining out. The water's just draining out, draining out constantly. It doesn't matter how much you run the taps into a bath with the plug out, it's not going to fill up. So your magnesium levels are never going to top up to the right level. So I know, Rob, you worked with a client previously who had an experience with this. So yeah, why don't you tell everyone like what was the impact of that and how did that go? Yeah, and I'm sure you have some as well, but I just jotted this down in our notes. Like I worked with a client called Lou and um, she had amazing results. So she signed up as a size 22. She was 17 stone or she was about three pounds under that, but pretty much 17 stone. And she went down to a size eight over a year and a half period with us. And she went down, um, to about nine stone and she's maintained that over the last year and a bit now um but it wasn't easy for her the whole time to do that it sounds like an amazing transformation and it was but she was actually really struggling with sleep um due to menopause and perimenopause symptoms so she had a really stressful job she's running this lab, um, science laboratory managing it and she'd often work 60 hour weeks and she really needed to sleep well for good energy levels um, obviously to manage cravings so she could see good results but she kept waking up in the middle of the night so she'd wake up at 3 to 4 a.m and she couldn't get back to sleep and this is quite a classic thing that I've heard from lots of clients um, as they go through perimenopause and approach menopause and she didn't want to go straight on to HRT so I suggested how about we have a look at magnesium I know I said basically I know your life's really stressful um, already so it's likely magnesium is probably low you're also going through perimenopause and having all these symptoms so it's also likely that's depleting magnesium um, and so she just got, again, it doesn't have to be a really fancy one. A magnesium citrate is a good source of magnesium. And if you're going to get a supplement, again, you can get it from all the usual places. And she took this magnesium citrate and within a week, she was sleeping through the night again. She was sleeping normally. She had good quality sleep. It helps sleep even if you're not waking in the night, by the way. So it still improves sleep quality. So when I've taken it, it does improve it as well. But if you are um, in your 40s, 50s, maybe 60s, and your life is stressful, then it's a really, really helpful supplement. And because she could sleep through the night, she had more energy, I means she could then felt, feel more like working out, she could perform better at work, uh, and her cravings were better. So that was one of the many things we did that meant she was able to see such incredible results. So not only is it really important then to get the fundamentals of nutrition right, right, so we've talked about avoiding those WADS foods, focusing on the key three, calories, protein, fiber, but it's also beneficial around menopause to get enough calcium, magnesium and vitamin d to feel your best and this counts it can sound like a lot to do and, and you know there are there's a lot of other things a lot of, a lot of other kind of details you could dive into with this and that's why we break it down into a 12-week process inside of our fit over 40 program with just kind of one to two things to focus on each week and when those little weekly changes are added up you can feel much better than you might think even during perimenopause and in the menopause 
just like one of our clients, Sarah. So Sarah, who is 51 from Preston in Lancashire, who is an MOT station owner. So you told us, Around two years ago, I started to gain weight as I hit menopause, even though I had really a really heavy and physical job at the time. Even though I tried doing the exercises that used to keep me fit on top of my physical work, I just kept gaining weight. I've always enjoyed making healthy meals for myself and the family, but I've always had a sweet tooth and snacks on lots of cakes, biscuits, and lots and lots of chocolate during the day. That was never a problem before menopause, as I've always been very sporty and active and would burn off all the extra calories. Then 18 months ago, I had a slight career change that meant I was more office-based and therefore less active. This is when the weight gain became more noticeable and I started to become really unhappy with myself because I'd allowed myself to become unfit and unhealthy. And the worst thing of all was that I could no longer fit into my beautiful clothes and motorbike gear. I just thought that I was going to have to put up with the feeling bloated, heavy, unfit, unattractive and unwell for the rest of my life and started to buy bigger size clothes, which made me feel even more unhappy. One evening a few months ago, I was streaming music and an advert popped up with a young man stood by a wardrobe talking about how it's possible for women over 40 to get fit, lose weight and get back into their clothes. That's uh, Rob on the advert. Uh, so I clicked on the advert. It was Rob introducing himself in Trinity Transformation. And the one thing that really had me intrigued was the fact that he knew about the menopause and what effect it had on women over 40. I didn't even know half of what happens to our bodies during this stage of life. So I read as much as I could about Trinity Transformation and I loved how knowledgeable they were. I bought the book that Rob had written and everything seems to just make sense. And I started to understand what was happening to me. I joined Trinity four weeks ago and I'm amazed at how much better I feel and cannot believe that I lost an inch from my hips and three quarters of an inch from both my bust and waist in such a short space of time. This has really encouraged me to carry on and I can't wait to get back into all my clothes. Thanks guys. Trinity has really started to transform me. I've always been so lucky to never have had to diet, but love sports and running, which always worked until I got older. It's only early days yet, but I've lost weight around my middle and bust and my tummy is fatter already, energy levels are up and I feel stronger and more active. I'm also positive that my hot flushes are less frequent and less intense, which is a godsend. My family are enjoying the meals as well as, and they are really supportive because they know how unhappy I was with myself. Do it. You will learn about nutrition, health and fitness, which in turn helps with menopause. Put, it, put in what feels like hard work in the beginning and you will see the results in no time at all. So you can see there, that Sarah started to see amazing results in her own fitness journey, um, as well as seeing results in terms of feeling better and reducing those symptoms that she was experiencing due to menopause. Awesome. So then where can people go if they want to find out more about the program that Sarah followed and all the stuff we've talked about today? So if you want to find out more, head over to www.fit40info.com and you can get all of the details on that page. Amazing. So that just about wraps up for today's podcast. Again, thank you so much for joining us and we'll catch you next week for another episode. We will see you then.